I am often asked why I first came to Japan. And when I'm asked that question, I often respond, my love affair with Japan began in a bathroom. <laughs> that usually gets some, you know, response. And I'll explain, but first let me tell you that I was、uh, born and raised in a middle class family in Los Angeles, but was lucky to be able to go to Stanford University. I went to Stanford with big dreams. I was going to be a doctor or a major league baseball player. And I certainly was going to、uh, see the world you know, on one of the great Stanford University exchange programs. Well, the dream of becoming a doctor ended very quickly. In my first、uh, quarter, I got an F in chemistry. <laughs> well, I retook chemistry in the second、uh, quarter. I did a lot better, I got a D. <laughs> Then my、uh, advisor in the,、uh, in the medical school said, Keener, do you really want to be a doctor or do you, do you just want to play baseball and, and have、uh, parties, be the social director of your freshman dormitory? And you know, I'm kind of ashamed to say I chose the latter. <laughs> But we had, some, we had some really great parties. <laughs>、uh, In baseball, I did quite well. I hit over 300 on the freshman team, but in my,、um, uh, the last game that first year, I tore up my shoulder, and the doctor said it would take a year at least to, to heal. So I kind of lost my focus on, on baseball, too. <laughs> and、um, I focused on some other things. And, and what did I focus on?、Uh, I mentioned earlier the bathroom story. I'm going to come back to that now.、Um, <laughs> I went to Stanford wanting to go overseas someplace, but I didn't know where. Um, in about my third or fourth week in school, I walked into the bathroom to relieve myself, and above the urinal was a sign that said, Spend a summer in Japan. <laughs> If you're interested, come to the explanation uh, uh, for this、uh, about the Stanford Keio University Exchange Program. And let me say, I went to that meeting, and my interest was pricked. Oops, did I say that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, anyhow, I was selected as one of the 12 students on the spring ex-、uh, summer exchange program, and I came and had my 19th birthday, a summer of 65, in Tokyo. <laughs> and as you can see, I was hooked. I went Japanese. <laughs> But in my sophomore year, I went back to Stanford. I found focus. I started studying Japanese intensively, and I became the chairman of the Stanford Keio exchange program. Um, when I, and, I, and, and in my junior year, I applied for a year's scholarship and I was able to come to、uh, Tokyo to Keio in, for my last year in college and I graduated in 68. But I look back at those years in college and I didn't study. I wasn't a good student at all, to my great regret. But what I did do, I did learn, was social skills, communication. And I learned that if you make people laugh, you can become friends. And friends is one of the biggest parts of your blueprint for success. The Japanese have a word called hitozai san.、Uh, it normally means、uh, your assets, your wealth. But if you change the hito to mean person,、uh, it becomes a play on words and it means your, your wealth of friends. And your wealth of friends is invaluable as a blueprint for success. Um, in that senior year、uh, at Keio, I worked at the Nichibei Kaiwa Gakuen, the Japan America Conversation Institute, taught English to make money to go back to graduate school of business. And I met a young professor, and he said, You're funny, you tell a lot of jokes. So he invited me to be with him on NHK. So I taught, on, taught with him on NHK English. But I didn't just do it straight, had to have some fun all the time. So I would get behind the camera when I was bored. <laughs> And about the same time, another teacher at the、uh, Nichibei Kaiwa Gakuen、uh, told me there was an advertisement in the Japan Times to work at the World's Fair in Osaka,、uh, interpreter guides for the American Pavilion. And、uh, I applied. And I was lucky. I was one of 60、uh, interpreter guides that made it to the American Pavilion. Out of more than a thousand that applied. And at the American Pavilion, since I had、uh, extensive background in sports, often I was allowed to take the sports personalities that came through the American Pavilion. And in March of 70,、uh, the San Francisco Giants professional baseball team came. 
and I was able to take the giants through. And with the giant's owner, there was a man by the name of Capi Harada. Capi Harada is the legendary bridge between Japanese and American professional baseball. Uh, Capi had been MacArthur, General MacArthur's personal aide during the occupation in World War II, and uh, after World War II, and Capi was given the job of restarting Japanese professional baseball after the war. And it was Capi who brought the legendary Joe DiMaggio uh, to Japan in February of 1954, along with Joe's even more famous wife, Marilyn Monroe. Cappy and I became good friends and stayed in close contact. Hito Zai-san, we stayed in close contact. I went back to the United States after Expo 70, and I was going to go to Graduate School of Business. And while I was waiting, I got a call from Cappy, Hito Zai-san. And he offered me the job of becoming a minor league general manager for a team in Lodi, California. He had sold that team to a Japanese man by the name of Mr. Nagayoshi Nakamura. And I was able to be GM for two years, and then Nakamura invited me to come to Japan and help him with his new Japanese team in Fukuoka, the Taiheo Club Lions, which has now become the Seibu Lions. And in 1974, I came and joined the Lions as the director of sales and promotions. And I wanted to start things with a splash. So I thought outside of the box, what could I do? How about if I had a real lion as a mascot? <laughs> I don't think anybody in Japan has ever thought of doing something like this. A little bit crazy. I found out I didn't know how to get a lion, but I found out at the time that if you had the money, a little over 400,000 yen, I think it was, you could buy a lion. But what do you do with it after it arrives on your doorstep? <laughs> uh, when Radachan, which we named her, uh, arrived, we hadn't planned where Dada would stay. So for the first two weeks, Dada Chan stayed in my apartment. <laughs> a lot of fun to have a little lion in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your room. But one evening when I came home, Dada Chan came running to the door, you know, like a little dog would, and grabbed my shoe and put a claw right through the top of the shoe, all the way through the bottom, just missing my two toes. <laughs> Anyhow, I knew then that we had to get a, a real trainer for Radachan soon and, and, build, and build her cage, which we did. <laughs> In that same year, 74, a really close friend that I had met at Stanford, Nobutada Saji, uh, the son of the owner of Suntory, who is now the chairman of Suntory, he came to uh, uh, Fukuoka. And we went out that night and set a personal record for both of us for the amount of, or the number of bars that we went to. We went to 14 in that night. Now, for him, it was mainly business, but for me, it was just a lot of fun. We even went in a Gunjin bar, put on World War II uniforms, and sang World War II fight songs with all these other crazy people in the restaurant. <laughs> kind of nutty, right? But it was a lot of fun. We'll never forget that. And later then, with Saji-san, we bought the Birmingham Barons, and I had a, baseball, a basketball player by the name of Michael Jordan who quit basketball and played baseball for us for one year. But that's another story. <laughs> for another talk. <laughs> After this, a lot happened to me. Um, because of personal friendships, Tozai-san, I was able to do a lot of first things. Uh, I was able to do the first major sports licensing in Japan. Um, was able to write sports columns and sports books. Uh, be the first Gaikokujin sports broadcaster speaking in Japanese. And also started the first sports bars and restaurants in Japan. Here's one of my addicts uh, in, in Kobe. Had a lot of fun here. And I know a lot of other people had a lot of fun here. A lot of laughter. And I was able to increase my Histozaisan network extensively because I had these sports bars. Here's a couple of my little friends, Wakunohana and Takunohana, just before they became Yokozuna. And I think you've seen Takunohana in the news a lot recently. <laughs> Usually not smiling so much. <laughs> but I can tell you, back in the day, we smiled a lot and we laughed a lot. You can see that laughter 
uh, is one of my big parts of a blueprint for success. I, it's just amazing what laughter can do. Uh, when I go into a convenience store or a restaurant and I get the bill and I'm able to put down the exact change before the person behind the counter can say anything, I say, keep the change. Otsuri wa ii desu. And the person behind the, the counter first looks stunned and then they burst into laughter almost every time. It's great. Try it. <laughs> My blueprint for laugh, L, is learn. Learn the language. I learned the language well enough that uh, I, I've been able to do my own sports shows uh, and I've uh, had two of my own shows, Heroes Bar and Marty's Bar, able to inter interview terrific people like the legendary Sadaharu O, oh, Ichiro Suzuki. We were both a lot younger then, weren't we? <laughs> That's over 20 years ago. But you know, learning the language is not enough. You have to learn the culture as well. I always tell people this, you've got to learn about the culture. I watch a lot of TV. I watch um, Tokudani in the morning, I watch uh, Hodo Station, I watch Sunday morning, I watch all these shows, shows because you've got to know what's hot. You've got to know about the culture, not just one thing. Otherwise, how can you keep, keep up with the water cooler talk? A in laugh, adapt. In 2005, uh, through another personal great relationship, I was introduced to Hiroshi Mikitani, uh, owner of Rakuten, and that led to my becoming the first general manager, a foreign general manager of any professional team in, in, in Japan. But you know that first year, it wasn't easy. We didn't have a great team. That was one of the big problems. Uh, but another problem was is that getting our foreign players to adapt, um, the first player I signed and signed for the most money didn't like Japan at all because there wasn't a McDonald's on every corner <laughs> and he couldn't he and his family couldn't get diet coke at the stores close to their their home uh, that family never tried Japanese food they didn't try to to learn it learn to like it and since he didn't adapt at all I had to fire him after the first year you understand it's really important to understand the culture that you're living in. It's still kind of hard for me to accept that people will come up in Japan and say, oh, you gained weight. <laughs> well, in some cases it's true. But, you know, in, in, in some cultures, this is going to lose you friends. Maybe, maybe forever. You just don't say this in certain cultures. But in Japan, if you understand Japan, it used to be in Japan that gaining weight was a sign of prosperity. Okay, so there's no big, you know, stigma to saying it. But Japanese, please be careful when you say it to us foreigners. We don't, <laughs> we don't really like to hear it. Anyhow, understanding the language and, and, the, and the culture is really important. But I want to stress one thing. You know, you don't have to agree with it. I don't agree with a lot of things I see in Japan, but I think I understand them. So trying to understand is really important. Give. Giving. The Japanese love to give. They love to give praise. Oftentimes, uh, when you meet someone, people will say, uh, when they're introducing to someone, this person uh, is someone who's really taken care of, care of me a lot. But oftentimes it's not even true, but they say it anyhow. <laughs> it's just the way it's done here. You know, and the pitchers in Japan, when they pitch a game, a good game, they'll always give praise to the catcher. You know, Masahiro Tanaka won 34 games for us, or 24 games for us in 2013 and had no losses, and he always praised Shima, the catcher, after the game. Let me tell you, Shima wasn't winning those games. <laughs> it was Maku. But it's accepted in this society. It's part of the way they do things, and it's good to understand that and go along with that custom. Last one, Harmony. My friend's very popular book, Robert Whiting's book, You Gotta Have Wa, is the most popular baseball book ever. The key, he says in this book, for being successful in Japan is not your skill level as a player. 
It's whether you can fit in with the group, if you can be in harmony with the group. That's the key to success. And harmony can be seen here in Japan when there's a time of crisis. I was so impressed with the Japanese after 3-11 when people stood patiently in line for a payphone or patiently in line to get groceries at a, you know, the few supermarkets that were open. And uh, there was no cutting in line. It was beautiful harmony. I'm often asked, how can I be like you? Well, I have no easy answer. I don't think maybe you want to be like me in some cases, but anyhow, I didn't take a, sing, symbol, uh, a simple you know, one path. Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, you can obviously see that I think laughter is a very important part of the blueprint for success. You know, nurturing friendships and treasuring them. And here you are. Here's your laugh. Learn abundantly. Adapt endlessly. Understand openly. Give ceaselessly. And live in harmony with your hosts. And if you like this little talk today, you can keep the change. Otsuri wa ii desu. Arigatou gozaimashita.